you could go as far as saying this is borderline criminal behavior on the part of publishers because taking public property, blocking access to it, then charging for it. So there's a double crime. You are causing preventable deaths from people who are dying and suffering from conditions that could be treated using scientific information. Okay, welcome back to the Saving Science video series. Just a brief recap. We started the story by observing strange scientific behaviors from very early on. And it was questionable behaviors in the context of a high stake, high competition environment, which seemed like a recipe for disaster. And sure enough, eventually disaster striked the as reflected in Daryl Bem's ESP bomb. But things turned around and it was the most exciting time to be alive as an academic, as an academic psychologist because it felt like we were doing real science again. And there's all kinds of transparency initiatives springing up and people coming together, forming replication initiatives and some uh, unprecedented large-scale replication collaborations and other collaborations. And uh, so it was a very inspiring, positive time. But then that got squashed by some pushback against transparency, pushback against replication itself. And then as we reviewed last time, the pushback got stranger and really more twisted and, and even more difficult to make sense of but which was telling uh, it helped it uh, because the pushback against just basic concepts like fundamental characteristics of science transparency replication so if you have uh, elite professors or anyone successful in the current academic system push back on such basic requirements, then that's telling you something more. So it, it told us even more about deeper problems in the, the system, even though it was kind of sad. And um, so today we'll talk about, unfortunately, even darker things involving criminal publishers and other ways the universities are broken. But, but we'll end on a positive note with some, some teasers about po more positive developments in terms of new tools and standards that are actively being developed to improve the situation forever. And so and the plan is to try to do that in uh, two final videos after today. So um, the first part, the first story is actually, it's, it's just something I forgot to mention last time in terms of more nuanced pushback against transparency. Um, oh, actually, no, this is against replication, well, and transparency, anyways. But before that, there was something else that I meant to show when talking about the initial pushback to replication. And so this is a blog post by, if I can find it, I believe David Funder. He has a blog called Thunderstorms. 
honey. And in this blog post, I guess I can show it. So this is his blog. He talks about, well, the title is The Perilous Plight of the Non-Replicator. And he talks about the negative consequences of not just failing to replicate another researcher, but the negative consequences of disseminating the information publicly. Um, but he makes a claim here that's so crazy that I actually had to email or I, I left a comment. Where is it? So, so he's recounting a story he was privy to where he observed directly a professor and graduate student who had a paper questioning an established finding actually accepted for publication in a prominent journal and they found themselves subjected to threats. Um, so the original author said, you need to withdraw this paper. I'm the most prominent researcher in the field and the New York Times will surely call me for comment. I will be forced to publicly expose your incompetence. Your career will be damaged. Your student's career will be ruined. The threat concluded darkly. I say this as a friend. I only have your best interests at heart. I mean, like, is this, this sounds like fiction to me. And so I left a comment saying, is this story about the prominent researcher threatening the failed replicators really true? Yes, it's true. I wish I could give more details. But discretion and the interests of the people directly involved prevent this. And this is actually, at the time, I was like, okay, well, that's a fair enough response. But now, because this is a long time ago, this is seven years ago. But now thinking of it, I would say this relates back to the ideological biases in academia, where the people are so sensitive, you can't even insinuate that you're you're being impolite, or you can't even uh, do anything you think might offend someone. But I mean, that's uncontrollable. You can't know what's going to offend someone ahead of time. Even psychologists don't know that and can't predict that. So it, it breaks down communication. But anyway, we don't want to get into that. But so this is dark. This is dark, dark stuff. And we don't know who this person is, but my best guess would be Barge. But who knows? Um, so that was just a quick thing I forgot to mention when talking about the initial pushback by Barge in 2012 attacking the elderly priming replicators. Though again, we shouldn't even use that term. Everyone should do replication. If you're not doing replication, you're probably not a competent scientist. Um, at least because you're supposed to be building upon findings. And so just to finish the nuance pushback, this was started by, and I'm, I think I won't name names. This, we'll just say it's in the relationship research area, which is literally the sexiest area of psychology. But that means it also comes with maybe more problems. Okay, we can close this. And so initially there was a paper about best practices. And the authors seem to go out of their way to find problems with being transparent in relationship researcher. Uh, area and of course there are issues right but transparency is not optional so you should be bending over backwards to to achieve minimum transparency but these authors were doing the opposite they were going over backwards 
bending over backwards to find reasons to not be transparent. Um, and such as citing intellectual property. Oh, there's a, there's a complicated legal issue about intellectual property and then uh, legal issues about publicly sharing data. And the only valid thing they mentioned was that with relationship researchers, uh, if you have a couple, two people in pairs reporting uh, their answers to questionnaires, it can be more easy to re-identify because then if a partner remembers their own answers, anyways, it gets technical. But so we just w wanted to respond to this paper and um, and then things got weirder. And so then it turned into, well, replicability, so their position turned to, well, replicability is important, but it's only one of seven important things in science, like generalizability, external validity, measurement validity, you know, all these other things that, of course, are important. Right, but the replication movement, the new idea was, well, we need to prioritize replicability so that we can productively build upon previous findings, right? <laughs> um, and by definition, the word priority means that you have to care about it more than other things. Like you prioritize sleep, well, you're gonna sacrifice other things, right? But this set of authors are arguing and again, this is after the replication crisis, Daryl Bem's bomb, people pushing for more replication, and it did happen. People uh, were doing more replications, conducting, publishing more replications, more journals were starting to accept replications, papers. And this set of authors somehow are arguing, well, replicability is important, but there's all, all these other things that are important like generalizability and validity and and we just couldn't believe it and then we just wrote well no again it's of course replicability is just one of important things but we need to prioritize it because again like esp i think i even used this example it was dismissed like should daryl bam should we go and investigate the validity and generalizability of esp effects but we can't even reobserve it, right? So how can you productively say, uh, is the measurement of ESP valid if you if there's nothing repeatedly observable, right? I mean, so anyways, uh, it it could go on, and it just got slimy to the point where you're thinking, are they actually? believe in these arguments in good faith or maybe they have conflicts of interest and in this case they do and this is why i don't want to mention their names but maybe one day they have books and op-eds and other appearances on tv talk shows and probably hefty speaking fees right and so and there could be other reasons, but of course, there's a there's a conflict of interest here where uh, it would make sense for them to to try to come up with these greasy, weird kind of pushback to replication because they want to have something they can. If people maybe their publisher or other people are coming to them, hey, there's, I heard about this replication crisis grumbling. Does that affect the relationship findings that you base your book on? Right? Then they could say, well, yeah, it's, it's an issue, but it, we're grappling with it. And, and there are trade-offs and we have to be careful, right? And then they can reference, link to this peer-reviewed paper and say, look, this is a peer-reviewed peer-reviewed paper where we're adding our voices to these complex 
debates. And it's true, these are complex issues. But again, transparency and replicability are not debatable. They're not optional. They're not really... I mean, you can question it philosophically. But again, like if you don't have sufficient transparency, you can't even do a replication. You can't even scrutinize a finding properly. And if you don't have replicability, then how do you know you're not just dealing with a mistake or a fluke. I mean, it's like in the computer science world. So I have come, I started computer science, then switched psychology. In the computer science world, if you find a problem with the software, you have to write out the steps that you can, that, that someone else can follow to reproduce the bug, basically replicate the issue. And the programmer, when he goes to fix the problem, they will make sure they can repeat the problem before they spend energy trying to fix the problem. And a lot of times the bug does just kind of go away or you can't replicate it. Well, it's the same in science. Why would I spend my time trying to build upon a finding if it can't even be replicated? And why would I time, spend my time trying to test validity and the mechanisms and maybe the gener generalizability of a finding? if it can't even be repeated i mean so again uh it was and in retrospect well at the time so we were writing this response comment getting it peer-reviewed and published and then i'm thinking why do i have to spend my time defending the basics of science that any high school person understands like am i living in some dystopian future i mean like it's it was it was wild but anyways we need to move on um it's uh i thought there was another oh yeah and then this is not just they did it again because uh anyways this prominent person who was part of the false positive psychology paper that documented how easy it is to um, commit a false positive error, meaning you conclude something exists when it doesn't. And they wrote a blog post saying, well, no, we need to prioritize replicability uh, so that we can build upon findings and actually spend less time doing replication. Right? If we prioritize replicability, by pre-registering our studies and ensuring minimum transparency uh, so that others can call us out if we've made a mistake intentionally or unintentionally, then we actually can do less replication because you will you can just assume that a finding you read in an article will replicate if you attempted it, right? Oh, and then a few other ones. Where again, oh, you should prioritize conceptual replications over direct replications. And it's like, no, this is exactly what got us into this mess. So again, are you just trying to publish something because you have nothing to do? Why are you attaching your name <laughs> to arguments that are so bad? It, it's just embarrassing. And that's why I can't mention their name. But, you know, uh one day uh, anyways so so now we're going to move on to universities before we get to the the big bomb the criminal publishers and some new ideas there that are darker than previously so i already mentioned we could go to this diagram i think i actually already mentioned uh, met several of these issues in terms of the university becoming more bureaucratic and more corporatized with many more business people without academic background. I mean, I have nothing wrong with business people. If they're going to make the, efficient, the university more efficient and r run better, then that's fine. But you need to hire people who are passionate about scholarship and research. How will an MBA 
know how to structure a university in terms of achieving its academic goals, its academic mission, if they have no background or experience in academia. And Lauren, the, the one colleague, he told me stories. I mean, it was already getting worse while I was there. And then later on, he told me a story where they would, because typically, traditionally, professors in a department, they decide who they want to hire and when they want to expand the department or how they want to structure things. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the chair and the dean would just tell them, oh, by the way, here's a new colleague. You know, she's going to be in neuroscience, brain and mind institute, for example. And, and they kind of were confused, like, well, where did the money come from? Or where did this hire, who had the idea of hiring them, right? So just strange things like this that suggested, well, and here's our theory or my theory, um, is that again, if, if you start running a university too much, like a corporation that's only goal, whose main goal is to make money and maximize profits, which again, there's nothing wrong with, we need for-profit companies. Uh, but a university, its main mission should be and is higher learning and scholarship and research. That's it, right? Money, you need money to do those things. You need to make sure you're not going into debt, right? So, um, and, there, and so there's all these other examples where you can, you can clearly see the university is more interested in research that's very expensive, that requires expensive tools like fMRI machines, uh, which are literally millions of dollars to not just purchase, but to maintain and all, you know, calibrating the magnets and all these. And so we saw clearly, and this is happening everywhere, where they started prioritizing neuroscience and expensive research over research that requires less resources, such as personality, psychology, and uh, English, and humanities. I mean, we can debate, well, in some ways, they increased a long time, way ahead of everyone. And that's another story that's more related to the <laughs> ideological problems, where the humanities are way worse uh, in terms of this homogeneous, radical left-wing ideology compared to engineering and natural sciences, which are, are more mixed. <clears throat> so, and, and of course, good research requires resources, but, but it, that means that if you happen, like even a medicine, a lot of medicine, I mean, software development's expensive, but, but a lot of medicine is, it, it is pretty cheap because you just need a computer and you need, coders so you should just be more neutral right a university should support the needs of the researchers and the scholars no matter what the topic is we we need broad and diverse yeah diversity again i mean you want a very diverse set of areas that your researchers and professors are are studying right you don't want to start preferentially preferring certain classes of, of ideas or topics. Anyway, so that's just corporatization. But in more recent years, I think I have, again, if there are accountability standards and, and they're, they're accountable to the public, then corporatization in itself is actually not a problem if you can ensure that you're still achieving the primary goal of the university, which is higher learning and scholarship slash research. Oh yeah, soft fraud. This is a sad story. But so when I was, eventually I was contacted by a postdoc at Western who had, who 
because she approached me before the fraud case uh, was investigated, and um, she had seen. I guess I had I had been covered by the local journalist in London about being part of the Reproduce Weed project and the other transparency initiatives I was involved in, and she thought I'd be interested, and I was, and and I yeah, included it in my book. But um, anyways, it's just one example, but she was not just systematically, so the more questions she asked as a postdoc in this heart research lab, she was systematically kind of socially excluded and um, kind of demoted. And then eventually she emailed the the dean and they weren't doing anything. And then they said they were going to do something. And then eventually she, yeah, she had to contact the funders. So she, uh, in this case, it would be CIH. HR in Canada, so Canadian Institute for Health Research, I believe. And so then they said, ooh, okay. And the the fraud in this case um doesn't really matter. It there was I think self plagiar plagiarism and then um figure duplication maybe. Oh no, and then the the bigger one is that so she was working on a special way to look at heart attacks. And this is why the story is really disheartening. <laughs> no pun intended. But um, and, and so they had developed this technique that they had published and she couldn't get it to work and she even went to the other lab where it was developed and they, they couldn't replicate it. And and so in every paper, they, they still kept claiming that they were using this technique, but she she knew it wasn't working. It didn't work. So for whatever reason, if they had maybe have stopped working or the initial was bunged up somehow. Anyways, and she um, got the fund. She had to get the funders involved. And they contacted Western and said, OK, you need to start an investigation pronto. And they said, okay. And then, you know, eight months later, nothing had happened. <laughs> so then they gave them a deadline and then they still missed the deadline. And it just gets darker and darker. And meanwhile, you know, she came to Canada to do her postdoc so she could continue in academia. And, and then she had to quit. And... And eventually, so it got worse. It, it So the university, they don't just not cooperate, right? I mean, there's, like, she had clear evidence, enough evidence that the funder got involved. And the university was just saying, no, nah, it doesn't seem serious enough. So again, how can we, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. If you're a university administrator anywhere in the world where this is publicly funded university, how can we ensure that this never happens again? That you have students or postdocs emailing several people saying, I suspect fraudulent activities and they can just ignore that? Excuse me? This is a publicly funded university. This should be unacceptable. The university should lose all their funding or be on probation or some kind of measure. And, and and I think they are working on it. And this is, uh, again, Europe is ahead of us, or ahead of, I mean, I'm Canadian, uh, though in Belgium currently. The, the UK are now putting a lot of pressure on the universities. And we have a collaborator, uh, part of Curate Science, Dorothy Bishop at University of Cambridge, and she's part of evaluating how the U University of Cambridge, prestigious institution, how they can show that they are increasing integrity standards. So this goes a bit beyond transparency, but it's in the same area of, okay, we need 
a system for showing that all professors meet minimum transparency standard, but also minimum integrity standards. And, you know, that's less interesting to me, but it's still part of it uh, in terms of ethics training and, and anonymous reporting so that grad students can feel comfortable reporting questionable behaviors. And I think there was another suggestion of anytime there's an investigation, all those inf all that information has to be publicly disclosed to the public. Because again, we've seen fraud investigations in the US and in Canada. Generally, they don't publish a report. They just try to pretend it never happened. And that's 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 not good. That because then you're not accountable, right? If the rule is any fraud investigation, all of the reports will be publicly disclosed at the end. That keeps the university accountable because then the public can go and say, wow, your track record is not doing, not doing so hot there, uh, whatever university, University of Toronto, Western. Anyways, so moving on. Um, to darker things. So that's what soft fraud tolerance means. It's... Uh, they're almost tolerating fraud. In that case, uh, the researcher had been getting huge grants from the Heart and Stroke Foundation and from CIHR for decades. So I guess that's the conflict because they get 10, 20% uh, of the money just put in their pocket. And that could also be regulated. They should lower it. I mean, that's ridiculous. It should be no more than 5%. You're not doing anything. You're just receiving money. Like that's that's criminal in itself. So <laughs> which is a good segue to criminal publishers, which is the main topic, though we're gonna keep going, not spend too too much time. So as some of you, this is getting into the mainstream, but um this is probably one of the strangest features of academic science is that Till uh, to this day, um, and it's not funny. Um, there's the weird situation where, again, um, I can zoom out. Individual researchers have to publish in journals to get enough publications to get a job at a university and then get grants, and with those resources, get more publications, but journals are generally owned and operated by for-profit publishers who, in a sense, steal public property and then imprison it. They lock it up, they block access to it, block public access to it, and then forces you to pay if you want to access it, including the researchers themselves, if their university doesn't have a library subscription, which is like a magazine subscription. So you heard that right. Uh, again, this is, is so surreal. And um, you think, well, how, did, how could this ever happen? That private commercial enterprises <clears throat> have swooped in here <clears throat> and they have by the way some of the largest if not the largest profit margins in the world larger than bmw apple uh because they're basically selling for as much as possible which for some universities it's 10 over 10 million dollars a year just to have access to publicly funded research that was carried out by publicly funded researchers and was peer reviewed by mostly publicly funded peer reviewers. And they take that, steal it, lock it away in a private property paywall, unless you're willing to pay like $40 per article to see it, or unless you pay the you know $50,000 subscription fee to the one journal, but 
in academia, there's 10,000 journals. So the library has to pay for, you know, $50,000 licenses for thousands of journals. But again, there's some positive and there's light at the end of the tunnel. Harvard has been boycotting them for decades. Uh, I think University of California also has now boycotted them, which means their own researchers don't have access to articles. But there are new tools, mostly Sci-Hub, though it's considered quasi-illegal, and we'll come back to that. Because um, <clears throat> to me, it's actually the other way around. Uh, it should be considered criminal to lock away publicly funded research. And so this amazing female Russian programmer who created and currently directs SciHub, <clears throat> SCI hyphen hub, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a, <clears throat> there's a good documentary on this, uh, though I forget the title, um, and I haven't seen it, but <clears throat> it's, it's really, uh, the more I think about it, it's probably going to go down in history of modern society as one of the most epic criminal acts of all time. Uh, and I don't say that lightly because, again, you have to think about um, what this means. This is... <clears throat> scientific information and we we know uh and i think one of the founders of plus one is it michael einstein or eisen he formed an open access journal because his brother was a medical doctor in the u.s and even in the u.s uh he did not have access to scientific articles about treatments for his own patients in time because the information was locked behind a paywall and he needed a subscription. Yeah, because I think before it was even worse. They didn't even allow you to pay for it. Like you basically had to have a license subscription or not, right? And then they realized, oh, well, we can start charging money. Um, and uh, But then think about where most of the rest of the world lives. In most developing countries, you have doctors and just citizens on their smartphones looking for scientific information to cure their problem or to treat their condition and they can't have access. They can't get access. And that's why the Human Declaration of Human Rights, I think Article 27, cites uh, access to scientific information as a fundamental human right. Every individual has right to participate and benefit from the products of science. And but of course, the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a legal does not have legal power, but um, it helps to position this debate into uh, the broader context. And um, uh, so. It's dark in many different ways. But again, there's progress. The open access movement is fierce and progressing. More and more universities are boycotting. But they have a lot of money. I mean, they have profit margins in the billions uh, every year. So they have better lawyers and more money than you and the, the everyday person so and yeah they're grasping at straws now they're trying to engage in corporate social responsibility by buying uh, buying up open science initiatives and these other innovative platforms to try to pretend they're cutting edge um but it's not going to work and if I had more money to invest, I would short them. Um, we have Wiley, Sage, Elsevier, uh, 
some of these are publicly traded, and so you could buy their stocks as a sh as a put option, and then when they crash, which is any time now, their stock's gonna plummet, and you could make millions of dollars predicting the future. See, we're gonna use ESP to help us predict how, when will the criminal publishers have their big crash and burn. So just a final thing, because this is a common response when I we talk about this. One is that there's a wrinkle. So at the end of the peer review, when the paper is then sent to the copy editors, which is the only thing they really do, is they send your Word document, your ugly Word document, and they send it to India, where these assistants make it look pretty into the PDF, even though, again, static PDF uh, should be a thing of the past, but at least they make it look pretty and format it. But in that process, they force you to sign a copyright transfer agreement form, which agrees, uh, which, which you, ha you have to sign it, and it basically gives them the copyright to your article that was publicly funded by a publicly funded agency and you're potentially working for a publicly funded university. So if anything, it should be the university's intellectual property. But as we'll see, scientific information should never be copyrighted in the first place. It just, it just kind of should be an, a, 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 um, a non-option. I mean, it should just not be possible. Just like data. So open data, data itself is not copyrightable for some reason. And so that helped the open data movement, following the open source movement from uh, the, the software world. So, so I've heard people say, well, you know, you're signing away. You know, you, you can't, you can't post your PDF on, on your own website because you've signed the copyright transfer agreement, right? But well, that's ridiculous because you have no other choice. The whole academic system is built on unique publications in these prestigious journals and all of them are owned by these evil publishers. So, and the second problem with that argument is that you're giving away something you don't even own. I mean, the the content of that paper is public property it's publicly funded so you don't even own it even though you wrote the paper it's public property you can't give away something that you don't own right you can't go to the public park and take the picnic tables or or like if a private co corporation came up to you and said you know give me those picnic tables you would say well they're not mine they're the public Right, this is in the analogy, um, and so and so they're exploiting the situation and coercing you to sign this silly document. But again, the document doesn't make sense. You can sign any document you want. It doesn't doesn't mean anything. But in this case, they've tried to use the copyright transfer agreement as a legally binding document that gives them the right to sue you if you violate the copyright law and which is what they've done with several platforms including sci-hub so sci-hub's currently in two multi-million dollar lawsuits against these evil publishers because she has a system to get around the paywalls But she's on the right side of history, and she's very smart, and she's hiding somewhere in Kazakhstan, or I don't know. And, you know, it's hard to sue someone from across the globe, and they don't really have a case. So, and again, it's a time bomb. I don't know, something's going to happen within the next few years. Maybe it'll drag on for 10. Who knows? But, um... But no, it'll be sooner because now there's 
Netherlands and Belgium are the first countries now to legislate new law. So now it's new law that forces publicly funded researchers to violate their copyright that they signed and post their paper within six or 12 months of publication. Huge victory just in the past couple of years. And other countries are following suit, including the US. Um, and recently there was a kerfuffle where several societies, including APA and APES, their main societies in psychology, professional societies, which I haven't really talked about, but too much stuff. They signed an open letter against proposed legislation <laughs> to mandate open access to all publicly funded papers. And then they got all this slack on Twitter and then they wrote a response that was half sensical and then they apologized again and wrote another response saying, oh yeah, sorry, we, we didn't mean it. <laughs> and it was also nationalistic or something. It was saying how open access would threaten American intellectual property or, or economic growth or some weird argument. But of course, it's orchestrated by the publishers who, who would literally lose billions of dollars overnight if, they, if the U.S. passes this legislation mandating mandatory open access to any and all publicly funded research. So that's, uh, that's the positive part. And again, it's... Um, Oh yeah, the final thing is the so you could you could go as far as saying this is borderline criminal behavior on the part of publishers because because their behavior of again taking public property and blocking access to it so you're you're you you've taken it from public property, moved it to private property, blocking access, blocking public access, then charging for it. So there's a double crime. Uh, you are literally causing preventable deaths from people who are dying and suffering from conditions that could be treated using scientific information. And so that would be called maybe manslaughter or or negligence causing death i mean i'm not a lawyer but you know um and it sounds crazy but you can make this case and uh it's it's a dark world but um there's billions of dollars on the line i guess uh, some people are willing to deceive themselves because that's the other thing you think like these who are these senior executives and they go home at night and meet their wives and their family and say oh how's it going billy how was your day at school <laughs> yeah i made billions of dollars blocking access to scientific information which kills that killed a thousand people today huh how was your day okay so um that's pretty effed up So that's journals. Oh, actually, we also need to cover the flawed, opaque, and nepotist, unaccountable peer review system, which I think we've already alluded to. Um, so when you submit a paper to a journal, again, most of the time they just reject it right away, called desk rejection, because the paper lands on their desk and then they just throw it in the garbage. Though now it's done digitally, so I guess you just delete it and then send the template later, the template letter that says, sorry, your paper is awesome, but we get so many awesome papers, we can't publish everything, which is fair enough, I guess. So 
once so if they don't reject if they don't desk reject it they will then find two or three or four peer reviewers which are other professors other other researchers that are supposed to be qualified in reviewing the manuscript for flaws for problems and to evaluate also the importance and the so-called theoretical contribution of a paper Though ultimately, your main job is to evaluate the soundness of, you know, how was the, the research conducted and do the conclusions validly follow from the observations, from the results. In the case of empirical data, I mean, there are a lot of non-empirical papers that are just conceptual or theoretical reviews. And it would still be the same goal of trying to find problems, of problems with their argument, problems with their data, problems with their conclusions. And um, but it's important to mention that reviewers are hard to find because people are busy and we're and we're not paid. You're not paid to review papers, and so there's not much incentive other than if you think something's really groundbreaking, then you might have an incentive to review the paper. Or if the paper confirms one of your previous findings, which kind of becomes a conflict of interest, which is another side issue uh, we don't have time to cover, but you can see just on the surface there um, that you simultaneously are the best person to review the paper, but also have the largest conflict of interest. So that's the general process but the issue is the issues are that most reviewers don't spend enough time on the paper like one or two hours and they typically don't have enough information because the transparency standards are so low you typically don't have the data uh, and you don't have all the details about the methodology Though that's gotten better, but it's still only negligibly better. And so if you don't have enough details and don't have enough time, then it's easy for papers to just slip through with some major problems. And we now know that most papers have statistical reporting problems and other problems and other misreporting issues. And, and it's opaque. So... You don't know who the reviewers were, though there are some people who now sign their names, but it's still the minority. And then the entire content of the letters, I mean, the reviews can be two, three uh, pages long, though typically only half to one and a half pages. But each, and it's, it goes for several rounds. Oh, right. So they, they send their reviews, the editor will synthesize them, and then and then they might reject the paper or they might say, okay, you need to do major revisions. And then you revise to try to address the issues. Then they'll re-review it and maybe even resend it to the reviewers for a second round of review. <laughs> and this can go on for years, literally. Um, and in the prestigious journals, it, it does tend to go longer. And, but it's opaque. At the end of it, they don't publicly publish the content of the reviews nor the names of the reviewers. And so, and, and now we know of all these kind of academic rings, kind of like drug rings, where, um, you know, you can kind of recommend people who you know are going to be favorable to your paper, uh, or, yeah, because the, the standard, and this is like an unwritten rule, so again, we better have this more explicit, is that like you can't be a reviewer if you've been co-author co with the person whose paper is being reviewed, right? And so, and that makes sense, right? But then, you know, there's still all these other connections that, well, and yes, we were even told, ooh, in grad school, that it's good to be f like kind of friends with people in an, an area of research 
so you you want to be friends with people in the area of your research who like your research but you haven't published with them because then you can you can suggest them as reviewers and i'm not making this up like and it kind of made sense but again that's a recipe for disaster and why are you even thinking that way right i mean it should be about pursuing the truth and getting to the bottom of things and building a cumulative knowledge structure not about oh how can we maximize our chance of getting published right so and nepotist well the nepotist is that you know there's often kind of these like i kind of just described that there's these areas where you know the editor is reviewing a paper but the editor and the authors of the paper are friends or longtime friends and as long as they have never been co-authors somehow it's seen as okay and again we'll never get around some of these issues right but at least be transparent and that's why there's now a new push which we'll cover in the last videos about open peer review so you open up peer review by not just forcing people to use their names and sign the reviews but also by publicly um posting the actual content of the reviews which is not just needed for accountability of the journals but it actually is more efficient because when you look at a paper and i'll show examples of this you can you can uh, there's often details that were discussed about the nitty-gritty of a paper that are never mentioned in the paper that could help you move forward on designing a follow-up study or testing or reanalyzing the data from a different theoretical perspective data that already exists i mean it just it just makes sense on so many levels and is more efficient uh, and enhances accountability so again a lot of positive light at the end of the dark tunnel um okay we're doing good and uh oh and then the ideological biases feed in there but uh so if the peer review is system is flawed then of course if your results are consistent with the dominant ideology which currently is more left-wing then it'll be easier to publish your findings because they'll be less scrutinized because it's it's just you know so we'll be an example of you know you find like a paper that allegedly finds rampant uh, sexism or subtle sexism or unconscious sexism then that paper would be easier to publish than a paper whose results goes against the prevailing ideology and lee jessam again uh, doing great work and heterodox academy too to try to talk about these political biases and how again transparency is is the key because as long as we're transparent about kind of how much political diversity a department has right then you can ensure that there are critic critical dissenting enough dissenting voices both in peer review system and just in general like whenever you're talking somewhere uh, you want maximum intellectual diversity so that you can catch these biases right um because these are very subtle and, and it's easy to deceive ourselves and that's why i mean i i try to avoid politics but um if i do engage or consume content political content i try to kind of watch a bit of everything kind of more liberal more conservative uh, more libertarian and then you focus on the ideas and you focus on applying your principles to the ideas and see how it shakes out okay so let's try to wrap up um so yeah so now we move to the funders 
and briefly societies, but I don't, I don't really think we need to go there. So the funders turns out have also several problems, and and here we're talking about public funders and nonprofit funders so i think we'll focus mostly on public funders given they are the largest sources and and uh, majority funders and so the grant application system is flawed in several ways it's also highly bureaucratic and slow to change slow to modernize and also again near zero accountability um and some of these flaws overlap with what we just discussed uh in the peer the flaws of the peer review system so here again yes you have uh your grant proposal is reviewed by other professors but again they have to be in the same area and so if you have some kind of theoretical clashes or other nepotist kind of friendly old boys networks, then that can cause havoc. And again, they're not transparent, just like a recent experience in Belgium. They don't, they don't publicize uh, all of the decision making into how grant proposals were scored and uh, the cutoffs. And so you don't know if they made a mistake or if they were biased by some conflicts of interest. Um, and we know they make mistakes. Last year, we, we even had a grant proposal feedback form, and it was supposed to show you like each comment for each question from three different reviewers and for the one reviewer the answer was coming from a previous grant from a previous year and i and i said what like this is we, we, you know we need to ask for a re-review like if they that made that series of a mistake then how do you know they didn't make a mistake with the score with the actual score and then, well, anyways, the other person didn't even want to contest it. And then we called anyways, and apparently it didn't change anything or something, but it doesn't, you know, that's, that's exactly why we need transparency and accountability. We don't even know, we can't even verify that they didn't make mistakes in evaluating the grants submitted. Uh, and now they're giving billions of euros to different research projects uh, based on an opaque, unaccountable evaluation system. And this includes also flawed assessment of researcher excellence, where they focus way too much on uh, counting the number of publications and and counting the impact factor of what journals you published in, which is completely flawed. I think we haven't even talked about that, but we don't have time. Um, briefly, the impact factor is the average time a paper in a journal is cited by other papers, but most papers are never cited or cited only once. And so in statistics, that means the distribution is not normal, meaning that the average of a skewed distribution doesn't really tell you anything about the typical uh, paper. Right, it it's it's I guess more intuitive. Like, ooh, you got your paper in a journal who whose paper who a few of the papers were cited incredibly a lot. So somehow that means your your article is also really important. I mean, it's some kind of twisted logic like that. 
and academics, if you look some of them on their CV, they, they don't, right beside each publication, they don't just cite the name of the journal. They literally will put the impact factor of each journal and like, ooh, 8.9. Yeah, this, and we know, and again, these are smart people that know this number is completely flawed and meaningless. Well, not completely meaningless. It could have a grain of meaning, but it's definitely not on the surface. You can't just say, oh, 10, impact factor of 10 means this. Um, I mean, I guess in the, in the roughest sense, you could use it as a relative metric where, okay, impact factor is 10 for this journal. This other journal's impact factor is one. And so all you could infer really is that the one journal is, is being cited more on average at the journal level, but not at the article level. Um, and so again, we'll talk about solutions, which to me is the credibility of journals should be more about the minimum transparency standards they require for all articles and the extent to which they own up to publishing mistakes and publishing replications that uh, call into question papers they publish themselves. And then you, you, we, we will be able to rank journals to help you decide which journals you get published in. And then it would make sense to say, aha, now there's competition to get into the most credible journal. And that's the sign of achievement, is that you just got it into the journal, right? Not the number of times that, pap that journal papers are cited. Though, again, in a rough sense, it does tell you that the papers are being read and, and cited, I guess. So again, we don't want to throw away the, the baby with the bathwater, which is what's sometimes proposed. Just the other day on Twitter, these people were saying, oh, we should just like, like not use impact factor and not even use citation count. So now it's, it's common on your Google Scholar profile, for example, to show your H index, which is anyways, this other impact metric of um, how many papers have, what's the largest number of papers that have that number of citations? So I forget what's mine, <laughs> I should know this, but let's say it's uh, 16. That means I have, I have at least 16 papers that have been cited at least 16 times. Anyways. Um, but, or people will see, will show you, okay, how many citations do I have over time? And so, and people, you know, it's kind of a, an achievement thing of, oh, I have like, you know, 6,000 citations, right? But again, it, the citation is, is flawed because it, you can get a lot of citations because your paper doesn't replicate or uh, maybe you have a lot of friends or maybe you got lucky and you published a methods paper, which people cite every time they use your method, right? So does that really mean you, your ideas are more important than someone who's actually studying a harder problem that has a smaller field, right? That's the other problem with these citation counts and H indices is that they don't take into account the size of the field you work in. Because if you have a large field like social psychology, right, so if anything, I should love the H index because my H index is larger than a lot of people's maybe just by the fact that social psychology has a larger population of researchers, right? Because people tend to be more interested in social psychology phenomena than you know these these really niche areas uh, such as i don't know not the physiology of uh, cells or other very technical uh, issues in a very very constrained uh, subfield Anyway, so that was a digression, but so yeah, we don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. 
because even if citation count is an imperfect unknown uh, measurement, it's still a noisy signal for, well, at least your paper's being cited and, and is having some impact. It's unclear what kind of impact, and, and, and there are companies and, and initiatives, Altmetric and these other people trying to improve the way we quantify research impact. Uh, and that's also positive, because I don't think we should just get rid of it. Um, because it's it's kind of fits the meritocracy ideal of and it's an incentive too like yeah sometimes you, you have to work on ideas that are unpopular but in general you should try to do research uh that other people will can build upon and will be interested in so that's a good incentive to um do something useful that people will use and therefore cite. And, and citation also is a, a lower bound for impact, meaning that because um, impact includes even just someone who reads your abstract or someone may read your paper or half your paper and not cite you, and that still counts, but that's not measured in a citation, right? So, so let's say you have 100 citations for a paper in 10 years. Right, you're like citing a paper is is just a part of like all the other people that read it and never cited it. So you could maybe assume that five times more people actually read it and never cited it, but you don't know that in the traditional archaic model because it's print and it's PDF. But now the newer platforms do keep track of number of views and number of downloads of the PDF. And then citation, and that's what Create Science is trying to focus on these these more meaningful direct metrics, right? I don't like an alt metric is improving, but that's one thing I, I I don't like about their donuts score. It, like it's not meaningful to say, oh, my alt metric score is is hundred twelve. Well, what does that mean, right? Like. So we're we're keeping it straight to okay how many views how many downloads and how many citations, um, in that order right so because citations should count more as a download, but a download should count a little bit more than a view right and then you can distinguish well what does count kind of like the problem with YouTube and viewing a video what how much of a paper needs to be read digitally for that for that to count as a view, but. That's the in the future, but it's you know it's exciting to think about because we need to measure impact. Even just personally, it's good to know that people are reading your stuff and building upon it, right? Okay, so last story about oh yeah, there's also again political ideological biases all over the place. If you propose to do research that's consistent with this ideological narrative of social justice or uh, inclusion and diversity it's way more likely to be funded uh, than something that's either neutral or inconsistent um, with the narrative. So can you imagine, you know, proposing research that would, that would examine negative unintended consequences of affirmative action, for example? I mean, <laughs> that would probably not even get funded. Um, Potentially, and that's just an example. And finally, that it's it's slow to change and highly bureaucratic. So there's this story from Hal Pashler, who uh, I consider the kind of godfather of the replication movement. He was doing it in the 90s. Um, and so he went to these meetings with the funders in the US and said something like, well, if you want to incentivize replication, then you can do at least two things. You can give money uh, to researchers to do replications uh, of important findings. And or you can, when you give a grant to someone who's doing 
uh, substantive research, you have to make it a grant condition that at least 10% of that grant money has to be spent on replicating an important finding in your own area. Right? And, um, and this is what they've done in the Netherlands, well, at least the uh, only the, the first idea, which is just saying, okay, we have a call for replication research. You can apply and get the money and then do replications, publish it. And that's great. That's it, but it needs to happen everywhere, not just in the Netherlands. Um, but in the U.S., he told them that, and their response was, "Whoa, that's a great, great idea." But we're slow to change. We're very bureaucratic, and this was probably six years ago, and nothing has changed. So come on, if you're <laughs> work at part of the U.S. government agency funding agency or any other government funding agency please for the love of god just make things happen institute these small little changes that go so far again two things and we'll talk about it more in the last two videos but dedicate resources specifically to uh, find replication of important findings in different areas and also make it a grant condition that 10 to 20 percent of a grant needs to be spent on replicating important findings in one in the area of the grantee those are so simple how could it take you years to institute that um and again the taxpayer will will know about this and is starting to learn about this and uh and we'll get to this. This is another big bomb in, in the final videos. Is that if your standards aren't increased, then maybe your funding should be pulled. Um, and which would be very sad because I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I subscribe to some libertarian values, but I would still not go as far as saying governments should not fund basic research. I think governments should fund, to some extent, basic research and scholarly activities, which informs the population and helps democracy work better, helps us solve medical problems better. But it needs to be well spent, and there needs to be an accountability system to make sure that money is well used. Um, or else you don't get any. So, but we'll consider that. Um, and so, the societies, um, oh yeah, and then the, the, the corollary to that is that universities, um, zoom out here, that are publicly funded also need better accountability standards so that they can be accountable to the public or else again if they're not going to increase their standards sufficiently uh, like what's happening at the university of cambridge well where, where they're trying but my colleague will report back say how have they done in six months what have they done in six months and if they don't raise their standards enough then also we have to consider pulling the plug um, because again the money can be better spent elsewhere um, if you're not going to implement simple measures and again we don't want more bureaucracy I I'm against bureaucracy more than anyone but you know you can have simple systems to just ensure basic transparency basic research integrity basic accountability um, just to keep everyone sane, to keep everyone from making unintentional errors. Because most of these errors, most of these problems are unintentional. There's only a very few bad apples, psychopath, fraudsters. You know, they are in the minority. But they can ruin it for everyone. So you need a system to prevent the bad apples from ruining it for everyone. And and, and so it's, it's, you don't have to be 
a cynic. Um, I'm a desperate optimist. I really believe that most people are good people trying their best to do good research. But if they're operating in a broken system at all levels in multifaceted ways, then there's no hope that they're going to be good researchers, even if they're trying their hardest. And yeah, the societies, we already talked about it. They basically suffer from the same issues. They don't reward the right things. They basically reward, they have the same perverse incentives as the universities, which is quantity over quantity. Over quantity. There's a typo. <laughs> quantity over quality uh, and these research excellence also have ideological biases and, and yeah, these exclusive clubs. And, and, you know, again, though, maybe there's nothing wrong with having, I guess, social clubs that require certain achievements. Um, as long as there are clear uh, criteria that are accountable or which the society can be held accountable uh, to determine membership. I mean, this is just a crazy idea, but again, thinking of, of things more in terms of transparency, you could, tr you could say, okay, we have this special club if you publish, you know, five papers that meet a certain standard of transparency and have not been overturned in 10 years or something, then you can be part of this club or something. But I don't know. Just, do we really need clubs? Um, but here we're talking also professional societies that uh, take care of conferences and journals, such as the Association for Psychological Science, which Again, um, they often are led by these administrative people who are scholars, but they're, they seem more interested in administration than research or something. And there was even a case at SPSP Society where there was a financial fraud and embezzlement like five years ago. Yeah, there wasn't enough going wrong in social psychology. There was the Daryl Bem and then the Stapel fraud case and then two other fraud cases and then SPSP fraud. And then, you know, it was just, wow. So, but again, that's not what we're talking about. That's financial accountability. Here we're talking about, well, if you want to be part of a professional society like APS, you uh, should maybe re be required to have a track record of meeting a minimum transparency standard. But we'll get back to that in um, the next video. So again, maybe just a, um, a quick recap of the general storyline of starting with some strange observations of scientific practices that seemed inconsistent with the basics of science that I'd learned in high school and we grew increasingly concerned then the Daryl Bem bomb happened. It was embarrassing, it was shocking, it was surreal. But then it got exciting because there was all these initiatives, transparency and replication efforts, uh, some, some efforts of unprecedented scale and ambitiousness. Um, and I was part of it and it was, it was fun. I mean, I'm still part of it, but then we experienced pushback that seemed very strange in terms of defensive, uh, emotionally defensive reactions to people publishing replications and threatening blog posts saying not to publish negative replications. And then uh, Harvard professors calling us replication bullies and other Princeton professor calling us methodological terrorists. So 
and then the pushback just got stranger and, and where you really start thinking, I mean, what kind of motives would you have to push back in such nuanced ways against transparency and replication? And that and then and only then you started thinking about all these other extra scientific motivations that people have and their whole career is based on findings that could be overturned and um and so it really becomes a multi layered multi stakeholder multifaceted broken system um which really does suggest academic science needs to be desperately saved and um not to mention the publishers and the, the criminal acts they are engaging in, which somehow is completely beyond our control. I mean, how can private, for-profit companies have hijacked, stolen and imprisoned our public domain scientific knowledge and now charging people exorbitant fees to have access to something that they paid to produce again one probably will go down as one of the most uh, a crime of of epic proportions that may not be matched for a while um and then problems with uh the funders and professional societies um and so, but again, it, there's so much positive and, and there's so much um, hope for the future. And as we'll see in the last two videos, um, it, it's, it's, even though we're still, and, and progress is slower, yeah, we didn't really get to that, but we're out of time. Um, Well, maybe briefly. So more recently, um, uh, the progress. Uh, so again, we've made so much progress. We should be so proud of the new transparency initiatives and replication initiatives. But when you look more concretely at it's been 10 years since the Daryl Bem fiasco, how much more transparent? Is psychology today compared to 2010 and if you frame it that way um, there aren't good numbers well there's one paper by Hardwick at all and it's pretty devastating it's a it's a representative sample maybe I could pull it up real quick um, And it shows pretty low levels of transparency across journals in the social sciences. And uh, it's, but it's from 2014 to 17. There it is. Uh, And so what they found here is something like 0% pre-registration. Uh, again, this is from basically 2000, we'll say 15. So that's only five years after BEM. So it would probably slightly improved. Um, yeah, and data availability looks not bad. 70, maybe 80%. Oh no, no statement. 
right? I was like, this just seems too good to be true. Uh, so it's still less than 20%. Eight and eight uh, looks like external data source, right? But that's still compared to zero, even just 2010, or like not zero, but close to zero. And then materials is actually study materials to do the study. Um, is 20% uh, as well. And then conflicts of interest funding statements, those are getting, I think, normative. Oh no, funding, public no funding, no statement. Uh, Okay, no, that's not that's not great. That's only forty percent have a funding statement, and only twenty percent have a conflict of interest. So yeah. So again, see this when you get down to specifics, there's huge room for improvement, and even among transparency advocates. So this is where it got a bit weird and disappointing for me is that if you look at some. People who advocate transparency, but then when you look at their website, they don't even really make their own research that accessible or, or may not always or necessarily engage in transparency behaviors themselves. Or again, they do, but there's room for improvement. But again, that makes sense because the current incentive structure is still broken. So... Um, there's still because we know from psychology i mean or just common sense <laughs> that um there's one thing to talk to talk and then walk the walk and uh because transparency is scary so even if you advocate for transparency um to do it yourself in your own research and then to publish that you know you feel a bit naked kind of so there's improvements, and as we'll see, we want to track it so that you can look at your record over time. And so you could see, oh, I'm meeting this transparency standard, and a, a larger proportion of my articles over time are now meeting this minimum standard, right? And uh, yeah, and then code is basically like three percent and uh, well protocol is 100 percent, but that means yeah just specifying the methods though often the question is more is there like is that really all the details and then open access um yeah that's uh 50 percent so again that's Clearly something to be proud of, but 50%, that means 50% is inaccessible to the public. And a lot, most universities in developing countries don't have access to, because they can't pay these crazy uh, fees. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of the state, um, even though that's just one large scale, uh, it's a representative sample from journals and social sciences from 2014 to 17. And through curating articles, we're trying to target the most transparent published papers currently in existence all around the world. And we have like over 400. And um, I'd say our numbers are uh, slightly better than the ones just reviewed. So maybe most papers um, or rather 30 to 40 percent of papers have materials data and code but tons of room for improvement um, okay so again the next two videos will uh, go over some of these new tools and standards uh, to help us improve the situation and so that uh, we can ensure the system is fixed and maybe fixed forever. Okay, till next time.
it's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.